Roller Coaster Tycoon is one of those rare games whose level of polish was well ahead of its time. Released by its legendary game developer Chris Sawyer in 1999, it's one of my favorite gaming memories, and it's still great, even nearly 25 years later. Made before the release of sophisticated game dev tools that exist today, it's coded almost entirely in the computer's assembly language. As a result, it's one of those titles that lets you get really under the hood, and it runs extremely well. Plainly put, it feels like building with Legos to play this game. Since I wanted a demanding task, when I revisited this title, I decided to try one of the game's most difficult challenges, the Micro Park. Its footprint is a stingy 15 by 15 tiles, and the task is to create the world's smallest profitable park, at least $10,000 in value by the end of October, year three. When planned ahead, the results are borderline art, roller coasters designed to perfectly fit to their space, and some of the most aesthetically pleasing designs of all the game's scenarios. I'm really not good at this type of thing. Which is why I think it's a great challenge for me in particular. And so it begins. It all starts in March of year one. A blank slate and an open track before us, ready to go the distance. Ten thousand dollars, zero guests, and one dream. But what could I fit in a park this modest? It starts with the hedge maze, of course. One of the smallest and most flexible constructions. The default prefab certainly won't work, so we'll need to fashion our own custom design unique to fit the specifications of this particular blueprint. Every turn is painstakingly belabored and our foundational attraction is prepared. Life is a labyrinthine maze of anxiety and financial planning, and my heart is in my mouth as our first guest enters the attraction. Will he be able to find his way out, or did I mess everything up? Hardly a moment passes when more guests come tumbling in, and the jubilation at the first rider's approval is immense. Right now we're charging free admission, so this necessitates shrewd pricing on each attraction to assure its sustainability. Hedges don't pay for themselves, after all, and it costs nearly $500 for this one exhibit alone. But will it generate cash flows needed? This process of automating one element's profitability and moving on to the next creative project is intensely satisfying. The mandatory merry-go-round, synonymous with everything Americana, is the next obligatory construction directly above the hedge maze. I know that this looks simple, but the truth is that if we don't plan far ahead in advance, we might find ourselves bereft of any good construction options later on. That is to say, you could really screw yourself in this game. The first time I played it through, I thought it would be a great idea to build everything underground, and then keep building the park up from there on in. In that instance, we ran out of money on landscaping, and spent the next two years staring at a large, expensive, and above all, unprofitable mound of dirt. If you're trying to make something that looks interesting, 15 by 15 simply isn't enough space to make something profitable, so you need to go vertical. Supports are weird and wonky in Roller Coaster Tycoon, squirrely strange things of baffling physical logic. How could a hedge maze support a merry-go-round, which itself is supporting an enormous, phallic sky drop extending hundreds of feet into the air? Nonsense. Nonetheless, the park went on and failure became the main mechanism by which I learned the patterns of recursion and doubling back on themselves, needed to make the rides and paths of my developing cube of a theme park crawl upon one another, level by level. In some ways, I really insist that this challenge encapsulates everything that makes Roller Coaster Tycoon so exciting and full of possibilities. That sense of maximalism on a mere postage stamp, anything could happen, and there are millions and millions of right answers. With the largest, most important elements of the park's composition placed, I turned to one by one stalls, those lonely filler properties in our park which would be obstructed from view beneath the jungle of scaffolding I prepared to construct. Information kiosks, doo-doo room. With the staircase completed off in the corner, I ventured my first custom coaster, the true John Hancock of your own personal flair. The wooden wild mouse was the obvious choice, capable of turning on a dime a full 90 degrees in the space of only a single one by one tile. I'll admit that not all of the trials were successful, but I didn't actually kill any of the passengers, and the rides were recalibrated before onboarding live people. Too bad, everyone loves a little tragic braking accident. But unfortunately, the ride was perfectly healthy and operational, sweeping passengers off on fun adventures. I sat back and enjoyed looking at the park from a distance for the first time. Ah. It was finally beginning to adopt that impressive, convoluted look that triggers a sort of aneurysm of serotonin in the brain. So much detail and complexity, begging to be painstakingly ogled, detail by detail. But I still wanted more. A coaster that reached up and above the others, circumnavigating the entire park in one majestic flourish. I endeavored a few more complex rides and met with failure, until finally I passed one that at last managed to make it back to the original station. 
Unfortunately, every single guest deemed the attraction too intense. They were aghast, taken aback in fear. Leaping lizards. I couldn't believe it, and I was forced to trade out my mega coaster for a meager replacement. It goes up, then down. That's it. An instant success. Up, then down. People loved it, and queued for many squares at their chance to ride. Drunken with optimism, I worshipped every square inch of the park. And while creativity is enough of a reward unto itself, now halfway into the challenge, I wondered if I would ever reach the park goal of valuation at $10,000 by October year 3. Coasters were in demand and highly valuable, so I decided to raise the stakes. After a little trial and error with a backwards coaster, I managed to create another wild mouse coaster that I thought looked interesting and different enough from the first one. A few more failed trials and recalibrations, and the attraction was opened reaching ever higher to the point where I could hardly even see the attractions resting below from before. Unsure if I would reach my goal, I started to just appreciate the park more, adding yellow balloons in addition to the default blue, and again observed the park. A kaleidoscoping blood clot of psychedelic wonderment, something flippant, threatening, quirky, and logical all at once. I raised the stakes even more. Every ride has its own parameters for construction, and some of them, like the observation tower, can be constructed atop impossibly small foundations. I built it, reaching ever higher toward the heavens, with not only one, but now two great spires proudly erected. Connecting it by entrance was certainly challenging, but profoundly satisfying, and it seemed we were now working on an entirely different plane than the one on which we had begun. Another moment to appreciate the new balloons diffusing their way into circulation, like new blood cells in the capillaries of this anomaly of a maximal 15 by 15 square. Park values fluctuated like a sinusoid, rising with the construction of new attractions, but falling as rides devolved into disrepair. It would demand every fiber of creativity to meet the $10,000 goal. Anxiety rose again, now only a few months and a few hundred dollars on the horizon. It evaded my grasp, outside the box thinking. I demolished the Viking ship, raised the ground, and constructed a set of 3x3 three three space rings, high and well above the rest of the park's attractions. Then I replaced the Viking ship, good as new. A triumph of planning that raised the rest of the park's value by nearly enough to pass the park value threshold and beat the challenge once and for all. With a few more stalls added, at last I passed the $10,000 threshold of park value. But I knew it wasn't over. Rides gradually depreciate in their value over time. I ventured a few more ideas, sketching out potential vendors lofted above the raucous Victorian underbelly of the park, leaning in over patrons. But band-aids wouldn't fix the problem. I needed something bigger. Even if it were all in vain, I would end up with the same sense of wonder as a child looking out of a plane as all the houses on the ground seemed to turn into anthills. My guests were well taken care of, mostly. What to do next? Security guards, mechanics, handymen, they were all hired. We had, after all, received the Best Park Food Award, Best Park Value Award. All my rides were open, too. I had plenty of cash on hand. Imagine achieving all that just to get smackledorfed at the last second by a $5 difference in park value. There had to be something I was missing. So it was that in the very last space of park, I undertook the construction of a second and final rotodrop, higher and brighter than the first. The park was complete, a triple-spired masterpiece. Perhaps there were a few more various vendors to add in on the bottom of the park, but that was all beside the point. After a slight tanking, the park's value rose right back up, well above the 10 grand mark, leaving us with plenty of breathing room and not a moment too soon for our October deadline, approaching close on the horizon. When at last we cross that tape, there are few feelings that compare to that magical moment when all the guests in the park release their balloons in a wave of oversaturated color to the skies. That official stamp of approval, that Easter egg that you succeeded. Applause, laughter, and general joy being had. Then they disappear in one great wave of pops. And what's left behind is a unique signature, my mind child, a projection of my gray matter in beautiful, oversaturated 1999 isometric pixel art. Sure, a little bit of boredom and ennui sets in with no goal left to complete, 
but it's hand in hand with the at times bizarre and dark humor underpinning this game's genius. A celebration of the tapestry of possibilities of the brain's creativity with the speed of circuitry and silicon. A quick Google search reveals tens of fantastic designs left by other players with their own unique signatures on this challenge, and it's one of the most special memories I have of gaming in general. Anyway, I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. Thanks for watching. A particularly special thanks to my patrons, none of whom were harmed in the creation of this video. Until next time.